Thank you. So we're not now going to uh, start with our first lightning talks of the day. And this session is uh, a session that's focused on the theme of intelligence inspired by humans. And first up, we have Michael Frank, who is a professor in our psychology department. And he's the David and Lucille Packard Foundation Professor of Human Biology. So Michael. Thanks very much. I'd like to tell you a little bit about my work on children's early language learning and why I think this can be an inspiration for social AI. Language learning is one of the key puzzles of cognitive science, linguistics, and psychology. How do speechless, wordless infants so quickly become toddlers who can understand language and use language to make their way through the world? This process happens incredibly quickly. Here's my daughter, Madeline, at 18 months. At that point, the longest thing she had said was happy B, which I think meant happy birthday. At 19 months, she combined words for the first time and said blue ball. At 20 months, 23 months, she observed that Spike doggy no food, eat dirt. She was talking about my mother-in-law's dog, Spike, and it's true. He doesn't eat food, he eats dirt. At 26 months, she was a teenager already. She said, Dada, move on body. Might need a little bit more space. <laughs> so you can see her here at 26 months. She's about two pounds heavier, her hair's a little bit longer, and she's got more dirt on her face. But these physical transformations pale in comparison to the expressive transformation that she's gone through. She's able to use language in a productive way, saying things that I never said to her to get her way. This input to uptake relationship has been studied in the cognitive sciences for many years. And in this history, models from artificial intelligence and machine learning have been a tremendous inspiration, helping us understand the relationship between language input and language output and generalization. This architecture here is a transformer network. Uh, it's been responsible for some recent state-of-the-art results in language modeling, producing incredibly interesting generalizations from language input. But I'd like to highlight one difference between this transformer and children. This figure shows differences in language input to different kinds of models. Each dot shows one million words of training input to a model. The red dots show what's received by an average two-year-old, 10 million words. In contrast, recent state-of-the-art language models receive more than 10 billion words of input. In other words, it takes a 1,000 times less data for a two-year-old to learn to speak than for a language model. Why is this? And how can we use less data to train our own models? What I want to argue for you today is that the social context of language learning allows children to do more with less data. How does this happen? First, children let others help them solve puzzles, receiving supervision, in the computer science sense, from the adults around them. Adults point out when something is ambiguous, help clarify the input for children in ways that allow them to learn. In my lab, we study the social ecology of these parent-child conversations, using sensors like cameras on the children's and parents' heads to get a good sense of what social information is available to the kids. But beyond just using that information, Adults and children, when they hear language, they think about what others are thinking, and they use that to make sense of the language they hear. For the past 10 years, my colleague Noah Goodman and I have been studying this kind of pragmatic understanding of language in context. We show people displays like this one, and we say, my friend has glasses. Many people share the intuition that my friend is the face with glasses but not a hat, going beyond the literal meaning of the word to infer the intention in context. We've constructed models of this process of recursive reasoning that describe the way that we can refine the initial meaning of a linguistic utterance to figure out what it actually means in a particular context. Critically, our experiments have shown that children can actually use this kind of information to learn the meaning of a novel word. So when we show three and four-year-olds these two dinosaurs and point to this one and say, this is a dinosaur with a gazer, children correctly infer that the gazer is the bandana the novel, more informative, more interesting, more pragmatically relevant feature of the dinosaur. The last thing that children know how to do 
much better than artificial agents, is to ask for help when they need it. When we show a child an object they've never seen before and we say, give me the DAX, they correctly infer what it is and give it to the experimenter. But when we show them two objects and we say the same kind of thing, give me the FEP, they look around, huh? And they look to the experimenter, seeking social gaze for help. In all of these ways and more, social reasoning skills allow children to do more with less data. And I believe by studying children and understanding this process, we can create AI that is more efficient with data and uses its social context more appropriately to learn to communicate. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was wonderful. Now, the next up is Surya Ganguly. Surya is an assistant professor of applied physics and, by courtesy, neurobiology, electrical engineering, and computer science. So, Surya. Thanks. Um, great. So, the, the human brain is the culmination of 500 million years of vertebrate, evolu of vertebrate brain evolution. And that's actually a really remarkable process because currently we lack any engineering design principles that can explain how a complex sensing, communication, control, and memory network like the brain could scale in size and performance over 500 million years without ever losing function. So we have a lot to learn from the brain. And I'll tell you some uh, work that we've done in creating better AI algorithms inspired by neuroscience and psychology. So one big uh, major difference between artificial networks and, and biological networks is the way that we model the connections or the synapses between pairs of neurons. If you ask a computer scientist, uh, you know, what, what is a synapse connecting two neurons, they'll just say it's a number. It's a, it's a scalar number denoting how strongly one neuron affects another. But the neurobiological reality is that synapses are highly complex molecular machines that, that can have a dynamic memory trace of the entire history of synaptic strength changes that have occurred uh, for a long time. And if you take this capability seriously, you can actually solve interesting fundamental problems in AI. Here are two examples. So for example, one major AI problem is let's say you want to do learning and memory with low bit rate synaptic communication between uh, neurons, say in a, you know, in a mobile cell phone. Uh, if you actually take into account this internal complexity, we were able to show that you can drastically improve the learning and memory capabilities uh, of these networks. Another major AI problem is the catastrophic forgetting problem. If you train an artificial neural network to learn task A and then learn task B, it'll forget how to do task A. But if you actually intelligently choose internal synaptic dynamics, you can, you can overcome this problem. Let's pop up a level to psychology. It turns out that, there's, that this, there's this remarkable alignment between the way infants learn about the world and the hierarchical structure of our world. So for example, if an infant's learning about the, the domain of living things, at an early age it learns to discriminate, say, animals versus plants. And then it learns to discriminate birds versus fish and trees versus flowers. And it makes finer and finer scale discriminations as it gets older. Now, Jay McClellan and colleagues showed, interestingly, that deep neural networks do exactly this. Here's a low-dimensional visualization of the trajectories of the internal representations of a deep neural network as it learns facts about a domain of living things. And you can see that the initial dis discrimination it learns to do is the coarsest one between, birds, uh, between animals and plants. Then it learns distinctions between birds and fish, trees and flowers, and finally the individual items. Okay? So this is kind of astounding. Why is a deep neural network behaving like an infant? Uh, we developed a mathematical theory to explain why this is happening in deep neural networks by discovering new exact solutions to their learning dynamics. This is a plot of the mathematical equations that we found. And you can see that it recapitulates the much more complex neural network simulations. And it provides conceptual insight into how hierarchical structure in the world gradually embeds itself into the synaptic weights of a neural network. We went on to discuss a whole bunch of other topics in psychology and developed a mathematical theory of them. And th by, by developing this theory, this raised an interesting question. Why does learning work at all? Why is learning so smooth in humans? You can think about learning as minimizing an error function over the space of synaptic weights of a neural network. Here's a cartoon picture of an error function. So learning is like a ball rolling downhill on an error landscape. And a critical question is, why don't we get stuck in local minima at very high errors? 
Well, this geometry that you see in front of you is geometry of a, of a function over two dimensions, a very low dimensional function. And our intuition about geometry in low dimensional spaces is woefully inadequate for thinking about geometry in high dimensional spaces. The error landscapes of deep networks are error landscapes over millions of variables, and the geometry changes completely there. So let's think about that, and we used ideas from statistical physics to think about that. Let's say you have some smooth function over a million variables, and let's say the slope vanishes uh, at some point. What are the chances that the function is a, a local minimum but curves up in all one million dimensions, like that bottom figure? The answer is it's exponentially unlikely, unless you're already near the bottom, okay? So the implication is that for large neural networks, Local minima at high error are very rare. Instead, you get these saddle points like the middle picture. There's always a pathway down. So the cartoon picture to keep in your head is that the, the error landscape looks like that where there's always a pathway down. And we verified this picture numerically in deep networks, but there's still a problem. The ball rolling down the hill as it rolls down a saddle, it still slows down. That slows down learning. So we developed a better algorithm to speed up the learning around these saddles. And it outperformed existing algorithms. OK, so just to summarize the nature of this interdisciplinary work, we started with the molecular neurobiology of synapses that led to improved learning and memory in AI systems. We also started with infant semantic cognition, which led to a mathematical theory of deep learning dynamics, which in turn led us to think about the statistical physics of the geometry of high dimensional spaces, which led to faster algorithms to descend saddles. So this involves a combination of synthesis of neurobiology, psychology, physics, and mathematics and AI. But more generally, in our quest to try to understand the most complex structure in our known universe, the human brain, and then to improve upon it, we're really gonna have to unite a whole bunch of disciplines. And I think HAI, stands poised to catalyze this unification across many disciplines as it moves forward along its intertwined quest to both understand biological intelligence and create artificial intelligence. Thanks. Thank you, Surya. So our next speaker uh, is Percy Liang. Uh, Percy is uh, Assistant Professor of Computer Science and by courtesy of Statistics. So, Percy. Thank you. Hi, thanks everyone for coming. So I'm gonna share with you a new perspective on connecting machine learning and natural language processing. So it's well known that the field of natural language processing has made enormous progress in recent years. We now have systems that can recognize speech, empower digital assistants, systems that can translate between hundreds of languages, and systems that can answer questions from text, which is something that our research group has been interested in lately. And driving all of these kind of successes in natural language processing is machine learning and the, the advances um, in there. But I'd like to turn things around a little bit for the purposes of this talk and think about not language, uh, learning for language, but learning from language. And to set the stage for this perspective, I want to, us to think about language, not passive text waiting to be analyzed, but rather an active communication system that humans invented tens of thousands of years ago to help us survive. So here's how machine learning works in a nutshell. So you show a machine learning algorithm, a lot of examples. So in this particular case, we have colored bars. Each colored bar is either a one or a zero. So now I ask you the question, can you figure out what is the thing that distinguishes the ones from the zeros? Okay, so maybe that's not a, such an easy task. And while machine learning algorithms can process this data much more effectively, um, it still has to do a lot of work to figure out what is the hidden concept. Now, how would you do this in natural language? You would just simply say the ones are at least uh, the ones where there's at least two red squares. So this shows the power of language, the ability to access the concepts directly, more succinctly, and less, leave less to kind of statistical chance. And it's also just a more natural and human way of teaching. So I'm gonna talk about two ways that we've implemented this general idea. The first in the context of information extraction. So the goal is to take large volumes of the text and mine information in a structured way. So in this particular example, we're trying to figure out whether two people are married based on reading the passage. 
So traditionally, what you would do is get a bunch of annotators to look at this data and read it and answer yes or no, are the two people married? And you can imagine this is very labor intensive, but moreover, you're only getting a single bit of information, a yes or a no, from all this hard work. So let's do something else. Let's go a little bit farther and ask the annotator, so why did you think so? Can you provide an explanation? Can you show your work? And so the annotator in this example might say, well, because the words his wife are a kind of a, a, a strong cue here. So, um, so we took these explanations and then we used semantic parsing to convert them into programs, a language that computers can understand. And we can run these programs on lots of unlabeled examples and in the process create a giant but somewhat noisy uh, data set which we can use to train a model. So we experimented with uh, several different domains and overall, we were able to get the same level of accuracy using these explanations as opposed to uh, labeling yes or no. Um, but even taking into account that explanations take longer, we were able to get a three to 50 X improvement with explanation, showing the power of kind of natural language. So here's another example. Suppose you're a graphic designer and you wanted to construct uh, beautiful 3D scenes out of uh, little primitives. So it would be nice if you could speak to your uh, assistant and say add two chairs five spaces apart and have this wonderful scene just appear. But this task is very complicated if you want to build it up from the very small building blocks and um, current machine learning algorithms would simply fail on it. But what would a human do? If you were trying to tell someone how to do this, you'd probably try to explain it. So okay, you add a chair, move five squares to the left and add another chair. But moreover, if people don't understand what chairs are, you can elaborate and recurse and say, okay, a chair has four legs, a chair base, and a chair back. And so in this kind of very uh, adaptive way, you're beginning to teach the system in a more flexible and hierarchical way than simply saying kind of a yes or no. So here's an interface we built, a prototype system where the user is trying to accomplish a goal, build some sort of structure. And the user types into a, a text box, and if the system understands, then all is well, the user gets his palm tree or whatever he's trying to build and uh, moves on. If the system doesn't understand, then there's a learning opportunity here. The, the system can explain, here's how you build a palm tree. And in the process, the system gets better on the fly over time, and in addition, uh, the user still gets his palm tree. So this is kind of a win-win situation here. So we ran this pilot study on Amazon Mechanical Turk over three days, and I was simply blown away by the amount of creativity that uh, people have online. They were able to build these amazing types of structures, but in the process, teaching the system a language that helped them be more productive at doing so. So to conclude, I want you to take away that language is this powerful tool for communication that we've been using effectively as humans to humans, but I think it's an important um, opportunity to infuse this capability for human machine communication as well. We've shown that by allowing people to provide explanations or definitions, we can dramatically speed up learning. But I want to point out this is only the very beginning. There's many hard research problems here, but also many opportunities to improve learning and make it more uh, transparent and effective. So thanks. Thank you. So at this point, I'm, I'm really, really pleased to introduce somebody who's been a friend uh, for about 30 years. Uh, I, he, he was my student. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and he has become an advisor. Reid Hoffman is the co-founder of LinkedIn, a partner at Greylock Partners, and on the board of companies such as Airbnb and Microsoft. Uh, he's also on the boards of nonprofits, including Kiva and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. He's the author of several New York Times bestselling books on entrepreneurship and talent management. And of course, he's a graduate of the Stanford Symbolic Systems Program. We taught him everything he knows. So, <laughs> Reed. <laughs> this
this is the kind of uh, leaders in uh, doing uh, various forms of technical and uh, deep work uh, panel. Uh, so that's what we're mostly focused on. You can think about it as kind of a uh, kind of compare and contrast in human intelligence and artificial intelligence and what we learn. And I can literally not think of a uh, better panel. At least this is the perfect four panelists uh, for this panel, in part because of the Human um, Artificial Intelligence Center high theme, uh, which is catalyzing uh, not just academia, but also industry and in public policy. And how do you bring that all together? And so we have a, um, uh, in addition to a phone, um, we have. Um, uh, we have both uh, amazing experts here from academia and from, uh, and from industry. And of course, people normally in my role kind of say, oh, they need no introduction, and now I go on for at super long length <laughs> on introduction. So I'm going to spare my panelists that. I'm going to do a one-sentence intro <laughs> per person just, to, just to, uh, to do this, although I may be able to make them blush uh, in an appropriate uh, one sentence. Uh, so I'm just going to simply go from uh, closest to me uh, uh, further on. Uh, Jeff Dean, uh, who uh, many of my uh, friends at Google have described to me as the world's best uh, systems engineer, uh, and uh, also in charge of many different things at Google, including Google Brain. Uh, Professor Alison Gopnik from Berkeley, who uh, was the earliest uh, kind of person to note uh, things like the, the relationship between mathematical models and children development and uh, kind of how uh, to actually think about this in these kinds of systemic ways and has been doing a, an impressive amount. Like literally, uh, like I read a bunch of her stuff. This is the first time we've met. I was super honored. Uh, Professor Christopher Manning, um, who uh, anyone who's done uh, AI has read his books in NLP. He's the director at SAIL here. Uh, and then uh, Demis Asavis, who is a, a childhood chess prodigy, uh, but also the CEO and co-founder of the, uh, also at Google, uh, the, 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 the amazing moonshot from DeepMind for artificial general intelligence. And when we were corresponding by email about how to kind of open up this, this panel, uh, one of the things that I had proposed as a way uh, to kind of start was to kind of say, well, uh, you know, this Turing test thing, which I presume everyone in the audience is familiar with, you know, the parsing through language, uh, which Alan Turing did in the very earliest days. What have we come to learn about it, and should we revise it? And Allison pointed out, saying, well, actually, in fact, he very quickly went on to say, maybe we should actually look at this as a, a replicating what a child can do because of that kind of cognitive development and what are the kinds of things that come out of this uh, amazing uh, kind of cognitive richness and capability. So that's where we're going to start. And since it was your idea to actually go to the, the second refined version of the Turing test, I will start with you. Great, thank you. Yeah, Turing, as usual, got it right in that second part of that famous paper. Um, and what he was pointing out is a bunch of things that children, the best learners we know of in the universe, can do that current AI is still just struggling to do. So current AI, and we had a wonderful introduction to that in the lightning talks. Current AI is great at taking great big amounts of data and then being able to make predictions and discriminations based on those big data sets. It's not very good at generalizing to very different kinds of contexts. And children can take very small amounts of data and are extremely good at generalizing, making up new ideas. In particular, they build up structured models of the world. A second thing that kids can do that AI can so far is that AIs are typically kind of locked inside of their own heads. Um, whereas one of the things that children can do is actually go out into the world and get the data, get the new information that they need. So they don't just rely on a programmer to give them the data. Uh, they do something that's a lot like scientific experimentation, except when two-year-olds do it, we call it getting into everything. But one of the things that we found in our lab is that when they're getting into everything, what they're really doing is systematically getting just the information that they need to build those models. And at Berkeley, uh, the other place, um, we've, been doing, uh, <laughs> we've been doing work designing curiosity-based AI that would be able to go out just get information and knowledge and explore the world for its own sake, the way two-year-olds do. And the last thing, which is something that Mike mentioned, is that they're social learners. 
So again, children aren't just learning in isolation. They can take advantage of the centuries and millennia of culture of the people in their past. And as we've seen, even the youngest babies are incredibly sensitive and subtle about picking up information from the other people around them, including language. So those three things, things model building, exploration, social learning, are the so clues to how children can learn so much. And those are things that are still just at the beginning in terms of what AI can do. And so as a panel, I'm trying to get some dialogue, since Demis has also referred to Allison's work to me before. I'm going to ask you to go next on the industry side, also thinking about like what do we learn from children, and how would you compare current state of AI with the current set of modeling a child's learning? causality, et cetera, and then what, what we're, where we're going. Yeah, so I mean, when we started DeepMind um, back in 2010, actually at the heart of our approach was this idea of generality being the key to intelligence. So um, as you Shane Legg, my co-founder, he, he did his PhD on the mathematical foundations of intelligence. And as part of it, he looked at um, you know, all the definitions in history of the last couple hundred years about what intelligence is. They're still not an agreed definition. But the one common strand he found was that it was the idea of performing well across a wide range of tasks. So, um, and we adopted that as our kind of um, working definition for AI as what was the key to um, flexible general intelligence. And it's this, uh, you know, this, this very quick ability to um, use your knowledge from one domain to another domain. So it's called, sometimes called transfer learning. And it's something, as Alison points out, that we still don't know how to do yet in AI. Um, there are many theories about what's needed. Um, including like what we, 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 we think that um, you're going to need abstract concepts or some ability to form abstractions, which um, from uh, not just sort of have implicit knowledge about what you're doing, but actually explicit knowledge about um, the tasks that you've, you've, um, you've mastered. And, uh, and I think that child development is actually a really interesting place to look. Um, because if we're building learning systems, one of the key things that we found out over the last five, 10 years is that you need to design curricula. So you actually need to design a kind of teaching program uh, and a set of experiences so that um, build up in difficulty so that the, um, the system can start off knowing nothing but slowly and incrementally build up to uh, mastering a, a difficult task. And um, you can't just go from zero to one. You actually need to um, do easier versions of that task and then build up in the way that we teach children. Um, so I think child psychology is really interesting to look at, child development. Uh, I also think uh, there's a lot of value in looking at animal evolutionary history and animal psychology, and we do that at DeepMind as well, as well as cognitive neuroscience. So, and we've always had that at the beginning. Uh, I mean, my training has been as an undergrad as computer scientist, and then my PhD was in neuroscience. So we've always believed in bringing together um, learnings from neuroscience and psychology with uh, machine learning, and I think that's the way forward for, for AI. Uh, Chris, one of your uh, colleagues here at Stanford uh, was contrasting the kind of the, uh, the word count between the open AI model, <laughs> right, and, and actually how quickly children learn. And in what you're seeing in terms of NLP and the return to kind of this natural language processing, how does this, this, this mode of, of where do we stand currently regarding children and what could we be learning from what the children do that kind of show us some interesting path forward? Great. Yeah, so I'd like to pick up on um, some of what Mike, Frank, um, and Alison Gopnik just mentioned on social learning. Um, my background is in um, working with languages and linguistics, and while there are many aspects of social learning, a huge, huge part of that is the use of language. So, um, you know, the exact details are somewhat in dispute, but, you know, it's quite possible that the basic intelligence of a human being isn't very different than a chimpanzee or a bonobo, um, that other kinds of primates can do sort of most of the things um, that we think about human beings as good at. They not only have, you know, great vision systems, great haptic systems, but it's been shown that they can plan, etc. But human beings have managed to get so much further than chimpanzees over the last few thousand years and essentially the difference is that we have this power of language which is something that so we don't just have individual brains inside creatures but human language essentially gave us the power of networking right that we can network together human brains through the use of language and that's then also an enormous part of then how children are able to learn so much so quickly. And yeah, so there's this sort of enormous gap between our current 
AI and human learning, where current AI can work well if we have millions or billions of examples. We can essentially externalize all knowledge and then the systems can learn pretty well, but that's orders of magnitude apart from how human learning happens. And as Percy Liang also talked about in his keynote talk, that you can get this orders of magnitude more efficient learning if you can use tools like human language to explain patterns, rules, generalities, things to pay attention to. And it's those kind of interactions that parents and other caregivers regularly have with little children. So speaking about efficiency, um, obviously one of the things that current ML uh, uh, does very well is learning certain tasks almost at uh, you know, amazing speed and superhuman capabilities, but we're still working on the generalities. Yeah. Jeff? Yeah, I mean, I think where we are today is you can actually solve lots of different kinds of really interesting problems by collecting large data sets in vision and in language and in uh, speech recognition. Uh, and train a system that can do that one thing, maybe a very difficult thing, but it does only that thing. And occasionally you might do learning of a few different tasks together, but I think what we really need to, to get to from where we are today is how do we actually train systems that can do thousands of things, tens of thousands of things, and then can leverage their expertise in, in capabilities of, of doing those things to bring to bear on a new thing that they, they're confronted with in a way that is reminiscent of how early children early in early childhood learn to figure out you know, how to do a new thing. It's like, oh, I, it's kind of like these other seven things I know how to do. There's this one little bit I don't know how to do. Let me experiment with that for a bit and figure out how to solve that new thing. Um, and can take cues in, in terms of language or other, other uh, things. I really think that's the direction we need to be going as a field is how do we actually build much more general systems that can essentially take uh, not a new training example and do well on that, but a new task and do well on that. So uh, Jeff and Demis, how much is the kind of the academic study of, of kind of the ch cognitive development of children part of the current research program? Right? Like how much does that factor into here's what our next things are and here's the next things that we need to be doing and what are the things that uh, are the things that you most kind of look at interacting with academia about to facilitate that? Well, it's, it's an area we follow very closely and we, we, we read all of Alison's work and people like um, Liz Spelke and there's a whole bunch of really great researchers in this area. So, um, so we keep up to speed with that literature. I mean, I think one of the key issues actually is that children, obviously, they, they develop, they can learn incredibly quickly, as everyone's pointed out on the panel, but they come with a lot of um, prior knowledge in the sense of um, their, you know, what they're born with, what our genes are born with, and what we're encoded with throughout our kind of evolutionary history. So children start with that, and um, their brain structures are sort of suited to the, the kind of world they're going to find themselves in. Of course, they're extremely adaptable, so we can, you know, learn how to use iPads and iPhones that, you know, didn't exist when we were hunter-gatherers, but the, 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 the fundamentals of learning are sort of already there and the structure and this desire to use language and so on. So there's a lot of that is probably um, already intrinsic in, in, in the evolution of our, of our brains. So the question, one interesting question is, is that there are probably multiple ways of building artificial intelligence. Um, but, um, uh, you know, one, one interesting question is the, the size of that search space relative to the number of solutions in it. And the human brain is the only existence proof of a solution that we have. So I've always thought it was given, you know, my betting is, is that this, the search space is far larger than the number of, you know, the, the number of small number of solutions. So it's worth us studying and trying to reverse engineer the one that we know about, which is the human brain. Um, but the interesting question is, is um, you know, with all these prior assumptions and priors that children have, and that's what allows them to learn really quickly, you know, which ones of those are really needed? In, in the general case. So I sometimes talk about what, we, what we're trying to find in computer science, at least in artificial intelligence, is the minimum set of maximally general priors. That's sort of what we want. And um, children are a good place to start. They're probably not the minimal set because we're, we're biological creatures and we have all these extra, extra add-ons that we need for, because, because we have to exist in the world. But um, they're a good clue. Like maybe you can start there and, and pare down and then get to the true sort of mathematical minimal set that you require for generalization. And, and what I just, just say, just following from what Chris was saying, of course, language is where we want to get eventually. One of the big
big things I see challenges in AI today is bridging the gap from um, messy sort of perceptual data that we now know how to deal with reasonably well, like vision um, with, with deep learning and reinforcement learning, these kinds of techniques. But we need to bridge back to the kind of classical AI, if you like, of symbolic reasoning, um, which in the past was using logic systems and so on, handcrafted logic systems. But we need to build back to there using our learned systems. And there's a sort of this chasm in between where um, I suspect things like abstract concepts lives and that we need to bridge until we can get to language. I mean, all of us agree we need, you know, systems could use language. It would be so much better. They'd be able to learn faster. They'd be able to explain themselves and so on. But one of the issues is how do we ground that language in uh, real concepts and real, real, um, data, real knowledge about the world? Yeah, I, I mean, I, would, I, I agree with what Dennis, Dennis said. And I, I think, um, you know, it's really important. We don't know how to build intelligence in an in a artificial way. And so it's important to draw inspiration from all the other fields of study that are looking at human intelligence, other kinds of intelligence, to get lessons about how we might want to sort of explore uh, this, this new field. Uh, and I think um, that means understanding things from neuroscience as we learn more about sort of uh, you know, various kinds of brain structures, understanding more from child psychology about how humans acquire skills in an early environment. Um, and I think, uh, you know, also that can draw inspiration from how real neural, uh, real neural structures are very energy efficient. I think that's going to be an important aspect of how do we actually build large scale computer systems that are very intelligent but energy efficient is what inspiration can we draw there. Now, it's important not to take this too far because silicon and wet biology have different strengths and weaknesses. But I do think looking across lots of different disciplines at the kinds of lessons you can draw from what we are now understanding about um, other, other organisms is going to be helpful. So uh, Chris and Allison, how would you elaborate on this kind of this current research program from the industry side? And in particular, what would you think is kind of the, the do's and don'ts as from thinking about it from the kind of like the childhood development or the, the kind of the, the human perspective and maybe perhaps with particular focus on language, which is probably the next thing we're going to get to? So I think one of the things that we've learned is that it isn't just about representation. It's also about things like motivation and affect. So uh, in kind of classical reinforcement learning, in a sense, you could think about that as a way of formalizing motivation. But one of the things that's interesting is that we have these kind of intrinsic cognitive motivations that we see even in very young children. And that's, that's, a really characteristic, that's a really characteristic piece of what children are like that would be, that we don't understand very well. We don't quite know how that works. And that would be a really interesting thing to try to build into the kind of RL uh, context. Um, but I think another thing that's interesting is that the kind of traditional tension has been between the kind of half handcrafted logical AI where we build a lot of the structure into the system, and then on the other hand, these systems that are very good at learning from data but aren't very structured. And the really striking thing that we see with children from the get-go is that they have this capacity to infer abstract structure from data. So it's certainly true that they start out with a lot of abstract structure, and that makes it easier, but they can get to really new kinds of abstract structure from data. So rather than building it in in the kind of classic way or, or just learning, there's exactly, I think Dennis is exactly right that there's this uh, capacity to use things like transfer, generalization, or analogy, or causal inference to build structure from data. And I think that's really going to be the thing that's going to be the key. Yeah, so I really agreed with what Demos was saying about how can we sort of get back beyond doing the kind of large-scale machine learning, which has been great for perception tasks, but also you can think of most of machine learning classification that way, right, that you have all of your inputs to it and you're just training as a one-step classification, this function that takes you from the inputs to, okay, you know, this is, a, is or isn't a spam piece of email. Um, but precisely what little kids do is that they can explore and experiment, see what the parts of something look like and figure out what this part means and then try and see what another part means and then they can compose knowledge together. So it's getting back to having 
computers that are capable of reasoning and thinking. And an essential part of this is that we have to have this compositional knowledge where you can sort of take parts you understand, figure out other parts, and put them together to make something bigger. And that way you're then combining um, knowledge and reasoning. Knowledge and reasoning used to be the central hub of artificial intelligence work in the 1980s. And the truth is it's kind of been lost in the 2000s and 2010. And yes, going forward into the 2020s, we absolutely want to be exploiting all of our new understandings of how we can learn from data, because clearly little kids learn almost everything that they know. But we also then want to be getting back into having the use of um, knowledge and reasoning, the kind of human thinking that Daniel Kahneman refers to as thinking slow. That's the kind of thinking that we haven't really worked out how to get artificial intelligence to do. So uh, before we get to kind of like what do we expect of the language and kind of wrapping back into the, 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 the almost the first version of the Turing test, I want to pick up on one of the things that Allison said, which is uh, the interplay between what you think of as the uh, the classically cognitive capabilities, because Chris is also doing this knowledge representation, you know, planning, reasoning, but also the kind of social motivations, right? The kind of the, the infrastructure, like the fact that we interact socially, the fact that uh, we have a set of, you know, like a set of drives that almost kind of drives this quote unquote unsupervised learning mm -hmm. as, as a way of doing this. How does that factor into how you're thinking, Demis and Jeff, in terms of, of what the next few years look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I think Alison's absolutely right. We're, we're, we're um, intrinsic motivation, as it's sometimes called, is a huge sort of research area now. Um, you know, what sorts of, uh, in reinforcement learning, you get rewards from the environment. So let's say you're playing a game, you get a, you get a score or you get a reward for winning the game. Um, but a lot of the things you do in the real world, you don't get clear reward signals from in that sense, certainly not short term ones, you know, maybe very over a very long time arc. So you get these kind of um, quite difficult mathematical challenges like credit assignment, like which of the million actions mm -hmm. did you do actually resulted in that reward you finally got? You know, which one do you ascribe the reward to? It's pretty difficult uh, mathematically to figure those things out. And in a lot of cases, you just don't have any reward signals. So how do you drive your unsupervised learning? And it appears to be, certainly in humans and obviously children and even animals, this intrinsic motivation. Certain things they, 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 they find intrinsically motivating. And there's quite a lot of um, uh, 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 knowledge about that in psychology and neuroscience. So for example, novelty seeking, um, the, the, you know, encountering novel experiences is intrinsically rewarding for our brains. You know, it releases uh, dopamine and we learn faster in those situations. Um, you know, the idea of um, knowledge gain, I think being information, uh, being sort of rewarding in of itself, there's whole theories about that. Um, you could even start thinking about emotions, um, you know, what, what, how are they evolved and what are they for? And some of those things are, in, you know, intrinsically motivating. Um, and then if you build on top of that social structure, um, you get even more complex motivations for things um, that, that humans uh, want to do in modern civilization. Uh, and in fact, sometimes those things can be gained on top of our biological emotional systems uh, and go awry. So we have to be careful of that. And then the other thing is in the social learning, and that's another huge area that I think is going to become very important in the next few years. Currently, we've mostly been studying AI systems um, that have been learning against an environment. Um, but very soon, and in fact, we're already working on this, we have a whole group that works on this, um, we have a multi-agent team that is um, uh, working on situations where you have hundreds of AI systems interacting, maybe with humans as well, all in kind of like a community, and that perhaps they're cooperating or competing or doing both. And, and um, what are the dynamics there? And I think that's going to be an extremely exciting area of research in the next few years. And in fact, um, I would say that's going to be the default, uh, at least for us at DeepMind, is moving away from single agent environments to multi agent. And then, um, you know, I think that's going to be an incredible test bed actually for, also for the social sciences to actually um, experiment uh, and see how multi agent uh, learning systems interact in, in group settings, which is quite difficult to, to do um, in. in, in normal experimentation. I think that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the difficulties is we have a pretty good set of tools when we have very crisply defined reward functions in, in sort of machine learning uh, environments, but that's not the world as it exists. You have all kinds of very messy reward signals. You have, you'd like to be able to specify rewards and goals as sort of abstract language, 
that a system can then understand and incorporate into some sort of multi-faceted reward function and, and motivations and things like that all, all play into this. And I think that's really um, where the next you know, many years of work will be. How do we actually build systems that can get a lot of the same properties that, that early, early learning seems to possess in terms of seeking out new and interesting creative ways to explore things and, and uh, build on that? So coming to language, um, we've obviously seen in the last even couple years amazing kind of acceleration for what kinds of language result we're seeing from the current uh, research program. You know, it's kind of the, the question of, you know, some people think the Turing test in this first version, not the child version, the, 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 the first sentence, not the second sentence, um, was actually already passed even by, you know, early programs like ELISA you know, in a specific context. Yes, yes, oh, there are very few people, but you know, it's kind of like, you know, you, you could, you know, do you, can you fool one human being? Does that, does that, does that work enough? Uh, what do you think about kind of like all of this, um, you know, the, the comprehension that's accelerating through, you know, Siri, uh, uh, Google Assistant, Cortana, Alexa, um, and do you think that the, uh, the Turing test will still be a good approximate for understanding, or what's the things we should add in as the approximates for understanding? And either of you can go first. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so we've made some amazing um, progress in human language technology, and so speech recognition now, turning um, speech signals into words is really, really good, right? Any of you can pull out your mobile phones and you get amazing speech recognition on it. And recent work in deep learning at Demis's group has also led to huge advances in turning text back into speech. Both of those external parts work amazingly well now, but when we get to core natural language understanding of actually understanding the meanings of the words that people say, we're still very far from that actually working well. And so that's why half the time if you use Siri and you try and ask something, it says, I'm sorry, would you like me to web search that for you? Because it doesn't actually understand um, what's going on. And that challenge is what Turing had in mind when he proposed the most famous version of his Turing test of um, someone talking to a hidden um, person or computer and whether the person could work out it was a human or a computer. But I actually think that original Turing test has been shown to be misguided and not an effective test of intelligence. So Alan Turing was obviously a completely brilliant man ahead of his times and things like that. But um, our, if you've seen the movie, you might have got a sense that his social skills were not his strong point. And an enormous part of human intelligence is actually social intelligence. And part of social intelligence is um, that we know how to interact in ways that people like. Little kids, very early on, you know, when they're only a few years old, start to learn how to attract their parents' attention successfully and things like that. But going on, we're used to having social interactions with smart um, colleagues. And so we have this bias to impute intelligence when words come out, even if you're really playing a parlor trick where you're just saying um, halfway um, appealing dialogue. And so what people have been able to show very successfully is you can write systems for the Turing test where you're doing parlor game dialogue of just saying cocktail party, interesting things. And the human interlocutor will think there is intelligence there even when there is no intelligence. In fact, it even goes the other way. So there have been simulations of the Turing test. Um, and one of the few human beings who has failed the, the, the Turing test as the um, other human who's being tested as to whether they're a machine or not um, was a person um, who was an English professor. <laughs> and um, the human that was testing um, concluded, oh, no human being could possibly know that much about Shakespeare. That must be a computer, right? So there are a lot of issues with the original Turing test. Well, I, think, I think one thing is that if you wanted to have a real version of the Turing test, 
part of the trouble is that human language depends on meaning, and it depends on being able to have this interface to the kind of abstract knowledge that Demis was talking about. So you, in order to have understanding, you sort of first have to solve the problem of having these abstract hierarchical representations of the world around you that are linked into just the, the, uh, the sounds that we make. And I think it's worth pointing out that even if you think about our current language understanding, it's in some ways, it's a kind of multi-agent problem of the sort that Demis was talking about, because it very much depends on the fact that we have an internet full of really good language users. And to some extent, what we I always think this is a little like the matrix, right? I mean, essentially what's happening is we're all being slaves to the natural language uh, processors, uh, processing systems that are going out and asking all of these people, what's the right translation for this? Uh, what's the right translation for this sentence? So it's really sort of crowdsourcing that capacity that we have to connect our high-level knowledge to, to language rather than just being able to do it from scratch. It's because we have all these other people out, th out there who have those capacities that we can, we can make those generalizations. But there was something else that I wanted to say, which is that um, I think there's an important point about childhood, which is more than just children can learn, but there's something about childhood itself that's special. So uh, we were, there was some mention about the evolution of human intelligence, and one of the interesting correlations is that large brains and intelligence seem to go with this extended childhood. And there might be something about the very fact that we have this protected period to do things like explore, um, and it, both internally and externally, that enables us to be able to develop these capacities later on. And, and again, in the case of language, we know that there are the capacity to learn certain kinds of aspects of language is much stronger in infancy, for instance, than it is in adulthood. Um, and I think that's going to be, turn out to be true for some other characteristics as well. So it may not just be we want to look at uh, babies because they're the youngest humans we know about, but there may be something really special about this design of having kind of a protected explore space on the one hand and then an efficient exploit space on the other that is part of what makes humans as good as they are at solving those problems. And at the moment, if you look at, um, if you look at even neural networks, they typically sort of have this unilinear, unilinear development where they get more and more data and make more and more connections. And if you actually look at the human brain, what you see is there's this early period of both cognitive and neural exploration, proliferation, and then there's a period where you sort of switch from that very plastic system to a much more efficient and effective one at the cost of being able to do something like learn a new sound system, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just to, just to follow up on a um, couple of those points in the Turing test, you know, I, I, Turing is one of my all-time scientific heroes, and, but I, I don't believe that he meant the Turing test to be a sort of rigorous test in the way some people have taken it. I think it was more like a thought experiment. For example, he didn't specify the expertise level of the judges and so on, which I think he would have done if he meant it like that. I think the deeper part of the Turing test is really, at the time, I mean, obviously Turing was working with very primitive computers, or not even computers, sort of pens and paper. And he was just, you know, that was the main mode of interaction is through a terminal and some, some strings of letters. I mean, he couldn't have imagined VR and computer simulations and all the things we have now. So I think really what he would have meant was, well, the deeper sort of philosophical part of that is, what if we can mimic all the aspects of all the capabilities of a human to the, to the satisfaction of another human observing it, then um, what would that mean about that system? Which then I think uh, uh, it becomes a very interesting philosophical pro um, point that people like Searle and Chalmers and Chinese room theory and all these kinds of Chinese room problem, all these sorts of interesting philosophical problems have addressed is, you know, does it really have understanding, even if it's exhibiting all of the right characteristics? Is it processing things in the same way? You know, um, is it conscious, etc. That, that, you know, that we would assume other humans doing those things would be. And I think he, he was just talking about text, um, sort of uh, this kind of rather primitive sort of dialogue, because that was what he could imagine at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, and then the, just on the other point about uh, learning, I think that one of the reasons we like reinforcement learning and as, as a paradigm is that just like with children, um, you know, we think that to learn things about the world properly, you need to be an active learner, yeah. right? So you can't, a lot of AI these days and is, is passive learning. You get given a bunch of examples, you try and classify them or something. You're not really a participant in your own learning. And um, 
uh, of course children are and animals are and uh, reinforcement learning agents are as well like what they what they know guides what they should do and that gives them and that determines what new experiences they're going to get and I think that's very important there's lots of theories in neuroscience lots of uh, neuroscientists propose that you know um, action is required for perception even you can't really properly perceive your world without action so there's a whole area of neuroscience called action and perception that advocates this that you really need to be able to act in the world to properly understand your perception and I think that's very interesting um, so I think that this active learning part is, is a key thing that we have, um, that we, you know, we take from animals and uh, natural learning, um, that they're active learners. Uh, so this will be the last question to me before we go to questions from the audience. There will be four different students with microphones in different areas. So if you're thinking about a question you're going to ask, uh, you'll raise your hand. The student will come to you. You'll have a mic. You'll know that it's your turn to ask a question because uh, I'll see you with a mic and you'll stand up. Um, but uh, so for the last kind of part of this technical thing, how does the fact that we can look under the hood with AI change this kind of concept of what is, does it have understanding, right? Because we obviously do various forms of looking under the hood with, with humans in terms of MRIs and, and in, you know, study of the neuroscience and all the rest, but we, you know, there's limits to how we can do that for kind of obvious reasons. How much does the notion that we can actually, in fact, go and do introspection, even in these very complicated neural edge, change our view about what the, what the research path looks like? I mean, I think one of the real advantages of computing systems is that they're very instrumentable, right? You can instrument anything you want. And that really can help us inform, uh, you know, what experiments do we want to do in order to understand some hypothesis we might have about how the system is behaving. Um, it can actually also inform how uh, we think about designing experiments that we then might want to replicate in real intelligent systems, uh, intelligent organisms, to then um, understand does that property seem to actually occur in real systems as well. So I think that interplay is really important and the fact that computing systems have this malleability and measurability uh, at any sort of arbitrary level that, that um, we don't currently have for, for real organisms really does help. I'd agree with that. I mean, we're, we're, I think we're at a nascent stage um, of understanding these systems. I mean, I think you know, the way I explain it is we're kind of in a transitory period where we've only just recently got these systems working, in a sense, to do anything impressive in the last sort of five, ten years. And then uh, the history of sort of an AI is an engineering science, right? The history of that is that you, you build something, you, you, have, you get it working, it does something useful or impressive, and then you can start reverse engineering it and, and doing ablation studies and all sorts of things um, that are obviously much easier in, with virtual uh, neural networks than you can with the real brain. And, um, and, and we, have a, we have a research program at, at DeepMind called Virtual Brain Analytics. And what I always say, and we have a very big neuroscience group led by um, this brilliant neuroscientist called Matt Botvinnik. And what I always say to that team is that we're in a situation at the moment where we, we understand and we have less good tools for understanding these virtual systems than we have for the real brain. We don't have fMRI or equivalent of those kinds of things, but we should do. And, 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 in, and in theory, in the next five plus years, we should be in an even better state because of the fact that these are virtual systems. So you can record, if you want, from every single neuron in the brain. We can completely control the stimulus input in ways that you can't, even with very controlled animal studies. And so, if anything, we should eventually be in a much better position of understanding these systems than we are even currently with the brain, um, the human brain. And, um, and I think that's what's really exciting actually about this AI approach of using sort of neuroscience inspired AI as an approach to building AI. Because I think eventually when we start distilling intelligence into this algorithmic construct, if we compare that then to the human mind, I think that would be one of the best ways to make progress on understanding what's unique about our own minds. Things like consciousness, creativity, dreaming, you know, all these debates that we're sort of in the philosophical realm at the moment, we can probably bring them into the empirical sciences by comparing uh, the, human, the capabilities of the human brain with um, these sort of artificially intelligent systems and seeing what's missing, what's, what's, you know, if there is something missing, what it is, and then kind of try and decompose that in something and hypothesis test what that might be. I don't think I have anything very different to say, so I'll keep it short, but I'm a huge believer in constructive models of understanding, that the fact of the matter is, whatever your analogy is, sort of uh, understanding flight, we just didn't have a very good model of how flight works when it was just, okay, birds flap their wings and fly, it's once we started trying to construct airplanes that we understood a lot more about aerodynamics, and I think it's exactly the same with human brains, that until we started trying to 
to construct machines that could think. We just had no idea of the complexity that was in our heads. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the idea, we know that there's computational systems that can do all the things that children can do because we've created them. And actually, it's much easier and more fun to create them than it typically is to create uh, computers. They're children. I mean, we know that they're, we know that they're, uh, or at least our very best bet is that there's some kind of computational system built onto a brain. And I think for a long time, the point of cognitive science has been to try to say, can we use that, can we go back and forth between understanding how those computations are possible? That's the best way we know of, of actually understanding what our brains are, do, are doing. And vice versa, going back and forth and saying, if we understood that, then that would be the way to create new systems. So that's been a, a po the point of cognitive science for a long time. And I think it's starting to be very productive in the light of the new developments that we've had in AI. Uh, one of my own personal hopes in this kind of introspection question is um, that there's this classic philosophical conundrum of is when is it correlation, when is it causation, and what are our models of causality? And maybe as we begin to be able to look a little bit under the hood, we begin to get some, some ideas both on when we actually have a model of causality versus correlation, and then maybe that will even share something on philosophy. But it is now time for our audience questions. I'm right behind you. So, uh, does someone have a mic yet? <laughs> Good morning. Um, I have a question about pedagogy. My passion is teaching deep learning and neural networks to the marginalized, people who don't have a background in linear algebra, multivariate calculus. And my question to you is, do you know of someone who is putting together a curriculum that people starting from no background can use to march up to the point where they can have a conversation with the generals in the army. Uh, I know that Andrew Eng talks about building that army of a million engineers to implement this dream that I think we all share here. And when it comes to pedagogy for the 90% of the people without the background, do you see it as we need to create that? Or do you see it more as, hey, you know, we're on the verge of having libraries for all of this, and therefore the marginalized won't have to know how to do linear algebra or calculus? Thanks. I mean, um, I think one of the great aspects of the modern internet is that there's lots and lots of different kinds of material available to teach concepts at all kinds of different levels. And so, um, you know, our group, for example, has a thing called TensorFlow Playground, which is designed for people who don't have a background in linear algebra. It's really a visual system for exploring how very simple neural networks learn. You can get a lot of benefit from just interactively playing with this. Let's try creating an, a neural network with two neurons. And, and does it learn to distinguish red and blue in different areas of some, some space? And that actually can interactively teach people a lot about the intuitive concepts without necessarily getting into the sort of deeper mathematics behind these kinds of, of systems. And I think one of the real benefits is that there's material available at lots of different levels for people and there's then an on-ramp for like you don't have linear algebra here's an earlier thing you might want to do and even an earlier thing you want to do and eventually um, you know depend and you can take that in many different ways like if you you care about being able to use machine learning without necessarily understanding the theoretical basis but want to then make it do something practical for your problem or your creative endeavor you can do that without necessarily getting a PhD in machine learning. And I think that's really one of the benefits of this uh, uh, sort of the fact that we can use these techniques in so many ways in the world that not everyone needs to be a PhD in machine learning, but we can have pedagogy that allows for that. Yeah, um, I'd be, be careful what I say because he might watch this, the video of this later. But my 11th grader is doing a machine learning class in high school at the moment. And um, if I'm frank, he doesn't understand much about machine learning. Um, but on the other hand, with the wonderful libraries and frameworks that are available now, I mean, I've just been gobsmacked by how much he's managed to be able to do that, you know, um, he, hey, I built a reinforcement learning agent, which he's got in his three-dimensional world, and he's actually gotten the thing to work. And I'm 
say, going, wow, how can someone who's not a graduate student be doing reinforcement learning now? So I think these modern libraries for machine learning have just had an amazing transformative impact. So to some extent, you know, the bottom line of what you need now is, gee, you should practice up your Python programming, but that's essentially the, all you need. Let, let's go to another question. Ah, great. Hi, Eric. Uh, hi. So I enjoyed this discussion very much about the Turing test and also about using the, the human mind as, as a model for artificial intelligence. And as uh, Demis mentioned, it, it's the only real existence proof we have, so it narrows the search space. It also gives us insight into what, how our own minds work. But there's another side to it, coming back to what, what Fei Fei and John were saying in the beginning, uh, that we want to build machines that complement, not substitute for humans. And the more similar you make a machine to what a human is currently doing, the more likely it is to be a substitute. Um, if you can make it augment and have very different capabilities, then it's more likely to, to create shared prosperity. So the question is, is, is there a way to get the best of both worlds to, to learn from the human brain, but also build machines that primarily augment humans as opposed to replace them? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think, uh, I, I mean, when we, when we talk about um, um, taking inspiration from human intelligence. I think, uh, you know, someone mentioned earlier, we're not, maybe it was Jeff, we're not trying to um, slavishly copy the mind. I don't think that's the right way to build AI and it wouldn't be good for the reasons you're talking about. And I think there's no need because silicon and carbon have different strengths and weaknesses and we should, um, you know, try to build, and I certainly see AI as, as an amazingly powerful tool that could augment human endeavor in all sorts of areas. I'm personally excited about accelerating science in that way. And I think we, we don't have to worry too much about that in some sense because um, the strength of uh, silicon-based systems is very different. You know, you can do things like Monte Carlo tree search and um, uh, you know, perfect memory, lots of things that um, humans don't do. Uh, and on the other hand, you know, what we'd be debating on this panel is things like creativity, uh, uh, emotions, other things that we think of as very human-based and social learning. So but I think there's a lot of very big scope there for um, collaboration and cooperation to augment what we as humans are able to do. Another question? Do we have? Great. Uh, thank you. I'd like to follow up on your point about uh, silicon versus carbon. Um, there is a, an architecture underlying all of modern computers known as the, the von Neumann architecture, which separates uh, memory and processing. And it appears that the brain you know, co-locates memory and processing uh, with each individual neuron. Um, so I'd like you to, to comment on what's going on today uh, with TPUs and other AI-based chips uh, and where that might evolve in the broader neuromorphic uh, computing uh, system. And then finally, I'd be curious to know whether or not you believe you know, these sorts of chip architecture changes are required to get to AGI, or if you believe we could get there without such changes. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think um, over the last five or eight years, we've seen tremendous advances in uh, the kinds of, of mostly deep learning-based models that, that we want to run on a wide variety of problems. And, the computations in those models are actually much more restrictive than the kinds of programs you want to run on a general purpose CPU. And that brings about an opportunity to create specialized machines that are good at those kinds of computations but aren't good at completely general purpose computations. So if you want to do low precision, uh, dense linear algebra kinds of operations, which is the bulk of what these building blocks rely on, then you can now consider building specialized hardware for that. And because it's specialized, it doesn't need to do everything, and there you can get tremendous efficiencies in terms of power, in terms of computational uh, ability per watt or per dollar, uh, and that's why you're seeing these kinds of architectures uh, happen, and there's you know, now a giant experiment going on with lots and lots of startups trying like different ideas in this general idea of specialized hardware space for machine learning uh, that's now pl playing out uh, in the sort of the, the venture uh, ecosystem. I think these are going to be really, really important tools because um, general purpose CPUs are not improving in performance. And we know that computation uh, is one thing that improves generally the kinds of systems we're able to build. Like it just enables us to do more, to, to build more powerful models that are, that are better uh, at different tasks. So, uh, and I think looking at neuromorphic kinds of things, uh, things like spiking neural networks and so on is pretty interesting because they have very low power characteristics, but I 
don't think we necessarily know how to use such systems. So we haven't sort of really uh, gone in that direction in terms of the specialized hardware more recently. And that's critical. I'd like to go to the next question. Okay, great. Let's. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. This is Lamia Youssef from Stanford University. And I'm curious, uh, Fifi earlier mentioned the pitfalls of machine learning and AI, and especially as we're talking about general intelligence. What the, where does the responsibility of regulating and uh, basically the application of different machine learning applications in different areas falls on? Is it the engineers, is it the governments, or is it policies, or is it a collaboration between all of these? I think the short answer will be all, but yeah. will someone start? Yeah, I mean, I, I can, I can uh, say, first, you know, the field is moving very quickly, so I think that's, that's an important thing to, to keep in mind when we're thinking about um, regulatory aspects. But I think you want regulators to be informed, so understanding where the field is, where it's going, is really important to help craft the right regulations. I think a lot of it depends on the application to which these systems are being put. So medical applications actually already have frameworks in the FDA and other other regulating bodies for regulating medical devices. You know, some adaptation of those for machine learning systems is probably better than creating completely new kinds of regulatory frameworks. I think it's on all of us who are building these, these systems to come at the, the ethical issues with uh, integrity and principles. And you know, that's one of the reasons within Google, last year we put out a set of principles by which we consider uses of, of machine learning and AI in our products, and also a set of things we, we will not do. I think that's, that's been helpful for framing our own thinking, and also we made them public so that other people who are wrestling with these kinds of, kinds of issues can think about it. But the issues of you know, fairness and bias and equity really are important things to think about whenever you're thinking about a machine learning system because they can perpetuate you know, the world that we live in and the biases that exist in ways uh, that accelerate them in some cases. And so I think, you know, all of the above is probably the right answer, but, but it's really important. I think it's important to say, you know, this is not a new problem for human beings. To some extent, the, the evolutionary design of human beings is that we have this capacity to generate new technologies, whether they're technologies like computers or even just technologies like new uses of language. And each generation, has innovations and then has to deal with the unforeseen consequences of those innovations. That just, that's just what being human is. And I think one of the things that's characteristic about humans, which is still not characteristic of AI, is that we can actually change our objective function. So what we can do in AI is we can say, look, here's the objective function. We want you, this machine, to fulfill this. But what we can do is we can say, no, wait a minute. Maybe that's not really the goal that we want. Maybe there's another goal that would be better. Maybe that's not how we should decide who's guilty and innocent. Maybe we should do that a different way. And so far, at least, that's a really human, uniquely human capacity, that capacity over cultural time to change the things that we think are important. And that's going to continue to be something that human beings are are going to do. But you know, since we since fire at least, we've had this problem about when we innovate, which is our great advantage, we always have unintended consequences, and then we always have to come in and have a generation that figures out how to deal with those uh, those unintended consequences. So that's part of the all of the above. But this is this is something that that humans have always that humans have always had to do and that we're sort of kind of good at, at least for now. So the timekeeper has given me the signal that it is time. Uh, I really appreciate the last question because to some degree, the all of the above is part of why Hi is created and launching today because it's bringing industry, academia, <laughs> government, public policy makers together in order to discuss these things. Uh, one uh, quick logistics thing, which is lunch is next. Uh, in anticipation of lines getting back in, uh, please try to come back a little early. Don't, don't wait until the very last moment, because otherwise it'll, it'll be slow. Uh, and uh, obviously, because after lunch, uh, Bill Gates will be uh, kicking it off. And so with this, please thank our amazing panelists. Thank you.